Welcome to WonderPod. WonderPod is the official podcast of Wonderfest, Ireland's first online children's book festival. I'm your host, Connor Brayden. In this podcast, we'll be discussing everything there is to talk about with children's books. I'll be talking with Ireland's top writers, illustrators, publishers, agents, and more. You can find out more about Wonderfest by heading to wonderfest.ie. Now, on with the show. Welcome to another fantastic episode of WonderPod. Um, but this isn't just a normal week, oh no. If you take a look, there are two episodes out this week. Um, you'll find in the other episode that's coming out today an amazing interview with literary agent Polly Nolan. But this episode is all about publishing, and I was given the amazing opportunity to speak with Matthew Parkinson, editor at Little Island Books. Little Island Books is an award-winning independent Irish publishing company. They publish only great books for children and young adults. They started life as an imprint of New Island Books, and yes, that's where the island bit comes from in their name, but they are now a fully independent and totally separate company. Little Island publishes 8 to 10 books a year for children and young adults. Most of their readers are between ages 4 to 16. They publish mostly novels for older children, kids from around 9 to 12 and then teenagers, as well as illustrated books for younger children. The background of Matthew himself, though, he, um, he actually explains in depth in the interview itself. So I'll let you hear about that from him. <laughs> Before we head into the interview, I'd like to let you know of another Wonderfest event because they are all so good. So the past couple of episodes, I've been mentioning and sharing the Masterclass events. But I think if you want to get a feel for what kind of books are out there at the minute and what the, what the landscape is like, you should take a look at one of our showcase events on Wonderfest. Um, the one in particular I'll flag you to today because with uh, Matthew talking so much about this kind of book with Little Island Books there's one where Ruth Ennis um, our social media guru (laughs) will be hosting a night where she'll be talking through a huge range of books for children 8 plus briefly saying hello to each author and asking them a quick question or two about their books so if you want to find out more details about that and all of our wonderful events please go to wonderfest.ie Enough on that, however. I'm sure you're dying to hear all about publishing from Matthew. So here we go. Matthew, hi. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Hi, Connor. Thanks very much for having me on. Not at all. Uh, first, just to start us off, could you tell us a little bit about how you got started in children's literature? Uh, great question. So I uh, actually began uh, working in England at Oxford University Press, um, working on on children's books. And specifically, I was working on uh, what they call in the educational publishing world, readers, um, which would usually be, in my case, it was was, uh, stories, illustrated stories of children, but intended for use in an educational context. So there was basically a bit of kind of pedagogical scaffolding around the story and, and certain kind of um limited range of language that could be used and so on for 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 young for young readers so for the uh, not quite as f- out there we're talking like the pm plus books the the rigby star those kind of books like the tar- it's that kind of neck of the woods yeah, yeah. so it's less it, it's it's actually great fun to work it's a brilliant way uh to cut your teeth work uh, as a children's editor because the there are very strict uh kind of constraints on language uh, and on word count, mm. um, and the very things like page turns and relationship between text and image are very strictly, um, uh, you know, related, and they're it's 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 all very well considered form of publishing, and you really do, uh, you know, you really literally will have a a meeting with somebody about a sentence, um, <laughs> so it's it's real nitty gritty stuff. Uh, which is which is a really good training uh, for an editor, and also uh, you. It's it's also series based, um, which is is also useful because you need to uh, you need to always be thinking about the relationship between kind of the micro and the macro. So this particular story needs to work in and of itself, uh, but it also needs to fit 
with a larger series and so on. Um, so I was that, that for a few years. I moved back to Ireland. Um, I just actually just moved back for personal reasons. I just wanted to live in, in Dublin again. I'd been near my family. Uh, so then I worked freelance as an editor for a number of years. Uh, worked for a lot of different publishers, doing children's and educational and adult and all kinds of things. Um, which is also a, a very good um, way of learning the editorial trade because you get a really broad range of types of book that you end up working on, but also different types of publisher. And you see from the outside the way different publishers work. Um, and I came into Little Island Books a few years ago. Little Island was founded by my mother uh, 10 years ago, Siobhan Parkinson, who was um, at the time she was Ireland's first children's laureate. And she was a children's writer. She found Little Island. Uh, so I, I came in to work in Little Island. An opportunity came up. Uh, and then, um, well, I've been there ever since. <laughs> very, very good. So you, you've always been um, drawn towards children, uh, children's books and literacy and all that kind of a thing. It seems to always have been part of your career. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, yeah, I mean, growing up in a house with... Uh, children's writer and and always being kind of steeped in in it and I suppose you know uh, Siobhan's attitude to children's books has always been that uh, they are a part of literature and uh, you know they're not something that should be thought of as um uh, uh, how should I put it? They're not something that is in any way lesser than adult literature or that should be treated as, as something just a way to get kids reading before they then turn into real readers when yeah. they're reading, you know, uh, Middlemarch. It, you know, that, that children's books are are important and valid on their own terms. That's And that's very much the ethos, ethos uh, of Little Island. Um, and, and that's really where we come from in our, in our attitude to children's books. You are not just creating the readers of tomorrow. You know, we're we're providing uh, material for the readers of today who just happen to be young. Yeah, I I, I as as a teacher, I have to completely agree because um, it, it is really <laughs> it really bothers me when I hear like adults talk about oh that's not a proper book and you know the, yeah. That that's a phrase. I know there's a certain there's a certain author we both know that's going to really get riled up when I said that. But <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, sure. it, it is out there with some adults, and it's kind of like, well, you know, a lot of children's books, especially with say the the middle grade, they really do blur the line of what is a kid's book and what isn't. Um, mm -hmm. just, Absolutely. You know, they can really like the emotions I felt uh, reading some children's books have been much deeper than some of the adults' books I've read as well. You know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so, it comes from, you know, it's not just about an attitude to children's books. I think uh, one's attitude to children's books comes out of one's attitude to children and to childhood yeah. and, and to whether you see children as having, you know, real valid experiences uh, of their own or as simply being kind of undercooked adults. <laughs> undercooked adults. <laughs> I love that <laughs> phrase. But no, you're, you're 100% right. Um, mm. So Matthew, just one thing I, I like, this is going to sound like a really stupid question and I hope okay. that, I hope I'm forgiven, but <laughs> what, exa <laughs> what exactly is the role of the publisher? Cause I mean, obviously the publisher is the, the, the company that will, you know, print the books, get the book cover designed, da da da. but surely there's more to it than that. So for the uninitiated, what does sure. the role of the publisher in a book? A useful way of thinking about it might be to contrast it with uh, with self publishing, um, which has become, you know self publishing has become so much more viable in recent years, particularly with Amazon uh, and eBooks, and uh, it's much more possible for people to, to self publish. So, but what what a publisher will offer is first of all editorial uh, expertise, um, that ranges from anything from uh, a thorough knowledge of the market, uh, an understanding of where a particular book sits within the market, to uh, an ability to work with an author um, in the development of their text, mm. and uh, and that a whole editorial process, which 
goes really from at the beginning, um, you you know, very large scale sort of stuff like you need to cut this by 20 percent. You need to remove such and such a character. You need to rewrite it in the third person, whatever, uh, all the way through to the later stages of the process, which are more about actually editing at the sentence level and and punctuating and so on. There are a lot of, I've, one thing I've learned over the years, you know, a lot of really good writers, um, every writer is different. They have different strengths. Uh, some writers are absolutely fantastic at uh, one area of writing, but you know, everyone has blind spots and so on that yeah. they that they that that w- w- they will benefit from having an editor working with them. Uh, and hopefully, you know, a, the ideal relationship between an editor and a writer is collaborative, and they work together to basically produce the best book possible. And the editor is there as a support to the writer and an advisor uh, in, in helping to bring through the book. Then beyond that, you get to, um, okay, printing the book. Uh, if there's illustration that needs to be developed, all of that requires, you know, certain expertise. Um, what kind of cover should go on the book? What kind of cover is going to help the book sell? Um, and then you get to distribution. Uh, and... That, this is probably the the area where uh, publishers are are, are pu- publishing with a traditional publisher, so to speak, is particularly valuable. Mm. Um, uh, well, apart from the fact that a publisher also will pay in advance, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, which 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 uh, you, you know self publishers won't benefit from. But um, if you if you want to have your book available for all the bookshops. Uh, there, there may be there may be routes for self-publishers to, to get books into, um, you know, whatever Waterstones or Eason's, um, but they'll be more difficult. Um, the distribution, which just literally means supplying the books to bookshops, uh, you know, warehousing them, making sure they get sent out to the shops, making them available for order to the shops and so on. Um, is a, a really important part of what publishers do that's difficult to access from the outside. Um, and then there's also marketing and publicity, um, which I would, the distinction between the two is still not always clear to me, but I was you know, about you to ask you to that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, publicity, I would say, is kind of narrowly to do with getting the book or getting the author into the press. Yeah. So uh, whenever you see uh, an article written by an author with a new book out or an interview with an author um, or a review uh, in, a, in a newspaper or online on a blog or wherever, that's a publicist is, is behind that. Uh, usually, sometimes authors uh, will take initiative on that as well if they have certain contacts or whatever, but usually that's a publicist's job. Um, things like advertising and so on might more come under the rubric of marketing. Uh, but again, that's... so. I, I, one thing about it is there are a lot of aspects to publishing a book from uh, editing, designing, printing, distributing, marketing, uh, publicizing, uh, having events on in bookshops and so on. That's quite a range of skills uh, which it, it, a publisher brings to bear. Um and and those are the reasons, really. A lot of some people really make a terrific success of self-publishing, mm. uh, and and more power to them. And it's great that it's become so much easier. And uh, but those are the kind of the range of skills that a publisher brings to to the to the project of publishing a book. And then there's the fact that they will pay the author up front, and then and then pay royalties. And then there's the possibility of also selling rights, whether that's selling rights onto a foreign publisher or to a film production company, and so on. So mm. a lot of routes to to bringing in revenue for both publisher and author. I think um, the, the one way I've heard of, um, like speaking as someone who has self-published and I, and I do understand the, the, yeah. the ins and outs, one major benefit that I see to a traditional publisher personally is that you're not alone, that there's a team behind the book. Yeah, sure, the, absolutely. The skills, the skills that I may have as, a, as an author in terms of publicity as opposed to marketing, um, <laughs> I'm yeah. 
I'm basing that on your definition. Um, <laughs> like I might be able to bring that to the to bring something to the table in terms of contacts that I have or something. Yeah. If I'm publishing with a traditional publishing house, I also have access to the contact the contacts that everyone in the publishing house has. Exactly. Well. Exactly. Yeah. 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 The other thing is, like, there are people. Um, I know some people who are managing to earn a living from self-publishing, which is remarkable. Um, but to to really seriously be able to sell uh, as a self-publisher, it seems to take a lot of time. Uh, and and you know, people who are really managing to 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 make their living out of it very often are doing it pretty much full-time or or it's like a, a second part-time job. Um, not everybody, not every author has that time and energy to dedicate yeah. to to it. So that's another thing. You know, <laughs> most of our authors have day jobs. Uh, and the writing and all the work they put a huge amount of work into the books uh, enormous amount of work into the books particularly in the writing phase but also after publication but then there's also uh, the publisher there uh, doing a lot of the heavy lifting particularly once once the, the book is ready to be published mm. um so th- this is i i feel like i know what the answer is this my next question all right <laughs> but i have to ask it because i know my listeners mm. to ask um like how busy is the life uh, of of an editor in a publishing house? I mean, how many submissions or queries do you deal with on a quiet day versus a busy one? Is there even such a thing as a typical day, or is it more like a typical week? <laughs> um, yeah, extremely busy. I mean, at Little Island, we're three people, um, three full time staff, um, so we're in, you know incredibly busy we're always right at the limit of our, of our capacities and we 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 work with a lot of freelancers freelance editors freelance designers freelance illustrators and so on mm. and out of necessity because we haven't got staff in in house but uh we just haven't got enough you know wide enough range of staff in house mm. uh, as anyone who's worked uh managing freelancers knows uh that requires a lot of work in itself and um, just coordinating the whole team that that is involved in a book, many of whom will be out of house. Uh, yeah, we get we get we actually have had our our submissions inbox closed for quite a while now because we became so overwhelmed with submissions. And we do, um, you know, we do make a point of checking everything that comes as long as it comes to us through the proper uh, channels in the way that we we ask books to be submitted. We do have a look at all of them. Uh, we can't give detailed. Uh, feedback to all of them because there's just far too many um, but we do at least uh, uh, check everything and and reply to people so it's it's time consuming uh, so yeah the submissions is a is a is a big uh, time consuming aspect of the job but it's also a lot of fun because yeah uh, you, you get it just it's 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 great fun. If you can't enjoy going through the submissions, <laughs> you're in the wrong business. You're that's the wrong job. You, <laughs> exactly. That's where you find the good stuff. Uh, and that's where you get a, a, a kind of an overview of what's being written, what people are interested in now, what kind of things people think are worth writing about uh, at any given time. And the thrill of finding a real gem in the submissions pile is, uh, is just fantastic. Um, so yeah, it's 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 we're always busy with submissions, but it is uh, we are very fortunate to be able to count that as part of our job. Excellent. Um, there, there's one question then I actually have for you. It, it's supposed to be later, but I'm going to bring it up to now. Sure. I in the first episode of this, uh, I was talking with uh, Oshin McGann, and we were talking about yeah. It, it, it can be very difficult to for, for prospective authors to be seen to be noticed for their manuscripts to be looked at especially because um the standard seems to be so high now like yeah yeah as a and not not to speak for you but the impression is that publishers ex- have a much higher bar now simply because there yeah, are yeah. so many people trying to write so one thing is um Sarah had said to me before that the one mistake people make when submitting things is submitting them too early. So from your mm-hmm. experience, how can an author know that their manuscript is ready? Like what, what's the, what's the yeah. thing they can do? It's, it's a great question. Uh, and it's really not easy to answer. Uh, we do get, we do get submissions, which just aren't ready. 
um, from, from a publisher's point of view, when we accept a manuscript, we say we're going to publish this. From our point of view, that's the first draft. Yeah. Now, it may have been rewritten 20 times over the course of several years, but from our point of view, this is, this is the first draft, and now we're going we're gonna to work on this and develop it. Occasionally, you get a manuscript which is basically ready to go, publishable straight off, but that's rare. There's usually at least some editorial work. Um, so, so from, we don't expect submissions to be totally polished, ready to go, uh, and we do want to be able to, you know, uh, ask for ask for changes. And um, knowing when it's ready to submit, though, is a difficult one. I think an author just needs to bring it to a point where they've really worked it over. Uh, they feel that it's tight. They feel that it's they could imagine, even though there is going to be an editorial process coming up, uh, if they if they get accepted, you need to be able to imagine those words that they've written sitting on a printed page on a on a on a bookshelf in a shop. Yeah. Uh, they don't, you know, if 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 they feel like this is just a kind of raw material that's waiting to be hammered into shape, then it's still too soon to submit to a publisher. Mm. Um, which is which is difficult because a lot of the time writers have a great idea um, or they feel they've got the bones of something and what they want is uh, some editorial help. Um, but unfortunately, if they submit something that is still in a bit of a raw state, they're going to be competing with other manuscripts which are, are, are more fully developed. Yeah. Uh, for for uh, com- competing in the sense of competing to be chosen for publication by publishers, so it is tricky. Um, sometimes we we um, one of the main things, by the way, I would say that we one of the main changes we ask for the manuscript is to reduce word count. We very often uh, ask authors uh, to to cut uh, sometimes a substantial portion of the manuscript because a lot of manuscripts come in too long. It's kind of under, you can kind of understand why that happens because someone's working on something for a long time and they've got a lot of ideas, a lot of things that they want to include. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the thing may just grow and grow the more they work on it. And uh, from our point of view, we want something to be sort of um, tight and not to have any excess, anything unnecessary. We want it to be sort of, you know, all killer and no filler. So we, we often ask people to cut things down. Um, so I, I, I would say uh, one, one, one thing, one piece of advice to an author trying to think about what point a manuscript is ready for submission is be ruthless, get out the red pen, cut things that aren't really necessary. Mm-hmm. You know, as I say, kill your darlings and yeah. be a bit ruthless about it. And that's a very good way of getting a manuscript uh, ready for consideration. Um, I, I've read, uh, and I'm sure I'm sure you've come across it if not read it yourself. On writing by Stephen King. And sure, yeah. Like I know Stephen King is definitely not an author. I thought I'd mention on this podcast about children's books, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I could not recommend that enough to any prospective authors out there. Because one one yeah. thing I got from it, I must reread it. <laughs> but one thing I got from it was. What, he, what Stephen King does is f- he'll finish the first draft, he'll type at the end, and then he'll have his word count and he'll say, right, my second draft, no matter what, has to be 10% less of a word count, which is a huge amount. Mm. Um, it is, yeah. But it's like you're saying, you, you need to have, you need to be ruthless. You need to really separate yeah. the from the chaff um, and kill your darlings, da, 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 all that kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It does, it just it book, and The book needs to feel... Uh, you, you don't want to lose the reader. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who 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 it was said that uh, famous quote about um, you know, uh, reading a novel. Oh, I'm going to forget it now. Reading a novel is an eight-hour dream, and uh, editing is removing the bits that will wake the author up, uh, wake wake the reader up. Oh, okay. Uh, so, you know, you don't you you, you want to rem- you want to cut anything that's going to lose a reader or break the spell for them, and just yeah. just keep what's absolutely necessary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
um the the one thing i i i found editing myself seeing as this is kind of we're talking about when i'm editing my own work is if at any point when i'm reading over it i feel like skipping a paragraph or two because i know there's a good bit coming then it's like oh yeah there's something wrong with those two paragraphs that i've I, yes yes you know it's small things and, like, and it's 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 often you know that as a, as a writer you know as you're writing something you become really fond of certain bits don't you you know these, yeah. these, especially something that's been there from the very beginning uh or 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 you're you've got to turn a phrase in there that you feel sort of proud of yeah um those are instincts to be resisted <laughs> because they can lead you they can they can cause you to leave things in which no matter how 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 uh clever they are or no matter how proud of them you are they of them you are the reader doesn't know uh how you feel about them and they, you know they just need need to have a text that's that's uh, been kind of ruthlessly trimmed yeah yeah exactly um so speaking speaking of uh, finding authors and 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 uh getting connected with uh, obviously we're, we're kind of ta- it's we're, i'm asking you to write a fine line between speaking for all publishers but also speaking for yourself <laughs> so be, i'm just wanting to remind my listeners matthew is just sure sure on publishing house but how like obviously authors i know you you are closed for submissions um we're, we're currently recording this in august but this is going to come out um yeah yeah in october um so check on little island's website see if they open now but um, yeah they might well be <laughs> um how do you, else can writers be seen or how do you find writers other than the submissions because obviously the submissions is a very important process but there you hear stories of authors who are asked by a publisher to submit um, yeah how, how does that happen uh perhaps not so much in the children's book world but certainly i know that that um uh publishers of non-fiction publishers often commission authors on the strength of articles they've written that may have been published in a newspaper or even a blog if it if it if it um had a kind of a an impact in the public uh, mm. a publisher might look at it and say oh this, there's a kernel of a book there and um, also short stories that get published in uh, literary journals um Sometimes will 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 lead an, a publisher to approach an author if they see promise there. Uh, so generally, getting getting yourself out there as much as possible and getting it out there that you're a writer and this is what you're about uh, can can lead to things. Now, uh, you, if, if you know if you want to be published, you're going to have to submit at some stage because you can't it's wait to be approached. No. And um, sometimes a lot of the time when, when also a lot of time when authors get approached to write a book. It's because they've got some kind of celebrity attached to them, and uh, you know it's always it's a, it's a little bit cynical, but it's from a publisher's point of view, they'll always look at somebody who's got some degree of celebrity and think, well, it's going to be easy to sell that book because the author already has name recognition. And mm. um, for us at Little Island, the vast majority of what we publish does come through uh, into our submissions inbox, um, and we we don't uh, require submissions to come through an agent the way some larger houses do uh, and we don't require that anybody knows us or is any way connected in the the books world um, or is able to name drop or anything uh, you know something can just come in totally cold from someone who's completely unknown to us and uh, if it's good enough to publish it's good enough to publish is is our attitude um, and and a lot of smaller and independent presses uh, will function that way and will be uh, not an easier route to getting published because it's still hard and the smaller the press the fewer books they're likely to publish so in a sense harder with a smaller press but there is at least the advantage that you, you don't necessarily need an agent there may be fewer hurdles to leap over uh, to get an editor's attention yeah um and that, that's actually one thing that you, you mentioned that you don't require an agent um uh to submit like you're you're open to unsolicited it's called submissions mm-hmm. um, yeah yep. to, to, to be clear as well though that seemed that's very odd internationally but it's actually par for the course here in ireland isn't it it, it is yeah um like generally in well in in britain i believe smaller independent presses will be more open to to unsolicited submissions um I, but i can't really speak with authority about british publishing certainly in ireland yeah it's it's fairly standard 
um, among the, the the Irish presses that were opened on so this unsolicited uh, submissions. And there aren't as many agents working in Ireland as there are in the UK. Uh, and there are, you know, it's more common for Irish authors, even those who have a few books out, uh, not to have an agent. And some authors, some Irish authors, just prefer to go that route and prefer not to work with an agent. Yeah, yeah, and it's 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 totally legit. But also, there's no yeah. with an agent. So, seeing, seeing as we're talking sure. agents now, um, from from your perspective as a uh, from a publishing house, what is the role of an agent from your side of things? Because uh, bearing in mind, like I spoke with Polly Nolan um, uh, from Paper Cuts Limited. Yeah, spoke about it from as an agent. But from your role as a publisher, how do you, what do you see the role of an agent as? Uh, well, agent, we do accept submissions from agents, and uh, you know, an agent is a great way for for an author to get uh, get through the door uh, or to get an editor's attention. Uh, as I say, there are some some publishing houses which will only accept submissions from agents, so they're absolutely essential uh, to have an agent to submit to them. Uh, but also for the independents, uh, particularly there's some agents that we have a relationship with, they know what we like. Um, they know the sort of books that are attractive to us. Uh, they, they don't just spam us with every submission that they have. They'll send us something that they think might suit Little Island. So that's always useful from our point of view because it's like this text has already been vetted by somebody mm. uh, and they've, they've thought, oh yeah, this might work for Little Island. So then we might be a little bit more, you know, we do read everything with an open mind, but... You know, we might be. We, it's 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 always interesting to receive something from an agent that we know and trust and have a relationship with because it might well be suitable for us. Um, but primarily, agents are there to represent authors and defend their interests. Um, so, you know, they will negotiate with the publisher on contracts, and they will ensure that everything is paid on time. They will ensure that royalties are paid. Um, they look out for an author's interest. Uh, from our point of view, we don't mind if an author has an agent or doesn't have an agent, uh, but they're they're really there looking out for the author's interests. Mm. Uh, and it's 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 something that it's it's funny because, as we said, there are definitely people out there who I mean, there's authors out there who publish and make a career without a publisher or an yeah. agent. Then there's people who yes, make, make it without an agent. Um, yeah. Having said that, there's nothing wrong with having an agent fighting your corner when you necessarily mightn't understand the ins and outs of contracts or whatever. Yeah, not everybody, not every author really wants to 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 read a contract or uh, get to grips with what royalties are, <laughs> which is a little bit esoteric. Um, and there are, you know, there are um, not very many, I don't think, these days. But there are publishers out there who uh, are less than entirely scrupulous in their dealings with authors. And that's where an agent will really uh, be valuable uh, if, if an author runs into difficulties with the publisher. Uh, independent presses where you, the author can kind of have a relationship with their editor. Um, things are maybe often a bit more transparent, operate on a more friendly basis and... Uh, you know, hopefully authors are, can be more secure in their relationship with the publisher at a, at a smaller house. So we've used the word author a lot in our conversation so far. Yeah. Um, I would like us to start using the word illustrator a bit. So yes. um, for, from, for you, I'd like, I'll ask you two questions, uh, but it's kind of the same answer. Um, for you in Little Island, how do you find or how do you come across illustrators? Is it a different yeah. process? And then it is, is how you do it the industry norm or what else could illustrators do to be seen by publishers? Um, to answer the second question first, I don't actually really know what the industry norm is necessarily. Um, bigger publishers will have dedicated art directors or art editors who make it their business to have a kind of wide portfolio of illustrators on file and to keep tabs um, on illustrators and find up and coming illustrators. Uh, I've never done that sort of work, so I'm not entirely sure what their process would be. Um, I think it's I think it's in some ways difficult for illustrators to um, to get noticed 
and to start out in some ways it might be more difficult for illustrators and authors because I think possibly there aren't as many defined channels but certainly there are organisations and associations of illustrators that can that can offer advice to anybody any aspiring book illustrators for us um, it is actually quite different the way we find and commission um, illustrators to how we do authors because uh, as I've said most of our Texts come through our submissions uh, inbox, email inbox. Mm -hmm. With illustration, we're more likely to go out and approach somebody and commission them. Um, And that is because we've seen their work somewhere in another book uh, or on another book cover or uh, sometimes, or we've just, you know, we've we've seen their work online. Instagram is a great way for for illustrators to advertise themselves. Uh, Various websites uh, that that illustrators can can advertise their work on as well. Um, we do also get submissions from illustrators, kind of a, of a portfolio or a link to a website. Uh, it, it's it's much quicker and easier for us to glance through a portfolio than it is to read a manuscript. So you know we do always have a check uh, of what we're sent, and if we think something uh, you know is promising, might fit with something that we want, we might do. We'll keep that person on file. Um, but, uh, you know, we we nearly always start with a text and then say, we want illustration for this text. And that's where we go and find somebody that we have on file or we spend some time looking on the internet to try and, and, and locate somebody suitable. And we go to them and approach them and commission them. Um, and one thing which publishers are often uh, will say to sometimes the dismay of aspiring uh, authors and illustrators is, generally speaking, uh, that's how it works. You start with a text and then look for an illustrator. Fully illustrated picture book submissions um, are not always a great way to go. Uh, because a publisher looks at a fully illustrated uh, picture book, which sometimes an author may have actually paid money for an illustrator to illustrate, thinking that's the best road to go. Mm. Um, But the publisher will say, that's a really interesting text, but we would actually want a completely different kind of illustration. Or we like this illustrator, but we would like to, we would probably want to redo most of the illustration from scratch, because that's an area where publishers really want to have control. Uh, so something that, that that is really important to emphasize to people, uh, don't feel that you need to submit fully illustrated work to publishers. And in fact, uh, it may well be better off not doing so. Yeah, because if you if you do that from the like from the from the uh, author's point of view, if you do commission an illustrator or if you work work with an illustrator and get them to do it, I mean, it might work in your favor. Like an, a publisher could look at that and say, oh, well, this author's made up their mind how this book is going to look. And we don't exactly. like exactly. that illustration. Exactly. So this is yeah. for us. Or we might say, we might say um, yeah, we'd, we'd like to commission this text, but we're going to go with completely different illustrations, mm. uh, which which can be difficult for, for an author who's maybe actually paid for those illustrations. Yeah. Um, or it could just be awkward for them to have to go back to an illustrator and say, they want to take the text and not the illustrations. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but publishers always think text, or generally think text first. Now, so like, I know that there are particularly author illustrators who write and illustrate their own work. You know, they will sometimes submit kind of dummies, uh, which they have, they have already, you know, illustrated and, and laid out like a book. Um, and and that's, how they, that's how that submission process sometimes works. Mm. But... Uh, they are those authors, those illustrators, author illustrators, are best advised to be aware that uh, a publisher is very likely to want to make changes to artwork. So, for example, if you work, uh, quote unquote, traditionally using watercolor or oil paint, uh, are you going to be able to make revisions that a publisher wants uh, to to the illustrations that you're submitting? Uh, you know, it's 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 you're you're probably better off submitting something. Uh, slightly rough, that can easily be changed or scrapped completely uh, than submitting a really well worked up 
uh, polished, finished piece, <laughs> which yeah. a publisher may well may well ask you to, to to heavily revise. I think I think that's a really sound piece of advice because, especially for the uh, author illustrators out there, you know, yeah. that might be tempted to really go to town on a dummy book. Um, yeah, you know, you don't you don't want to put your blood, sweat, and tears into something and then be told, actually, could you make the main character's hair red instead of black? You know, yeah, exactly. not that it would ever be that exactly. minor, but you know what I mean. Yeah, That's no, good. and and I don't, I don't really um, handle art direction at Little Island uh, personally, so I don't actually speak, or speak the language of illustration very accurately, but uh, if you are someone who does work traditionally, uh, like you like to take a, a paintbrush to the page, that's how you, that's how you operate. Um, beware that revisions is something that publishers ask for. Uh, so, you know, you'll need to kind of think about that in your process. Uh, and if you also are able to work digitally, you know, y- you may want to submit uh, a dummy done using digital techniques, which can easily be changed. And, and then move to a traditional uh, technique later, if that's your preference, uh, rather than, you know, working on a lot of paintings, which, which, which are difficult to alter at a later stage. And increasingly, illustrators do uh, work on screen, I find. And I think a lot of that is because it's more adaptable. It's more open to making revisions. It's more possible to, to take a layer out and isolate a particular image from, a, from an artwork and so on. Having said that, uh, we at Little Island really like uh, traditional illustration. Um, you can achieve a certain kind of quality of of, of uh, texture, which you can't always easily achieve digitally. So, so anyone who who does work traditionally or would like to shouldn't be put off thinking that that there's a place for that. Um, but they 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 will need to be aware that. That revisions and sometimes heavy revisions, something they're going to have to deal with at some stage. So they have to <laughs> have to think about how to how to manage that. Um, I feel so bad from for the illustrators listening right now because that was one mix. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, no, it, yeah, I suppose <laughs> I guess it's a matter of it's a matter of 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 an sort of finding um, finding a technique they can use which can be revised. Or, or finding a way of working with a publisher where they will uh, be able to to produce uh, uh, r- rough uh, or draft artwork um, to a decent standard, bef- and, and and agree any changes or agree any details with the publisher uh, before then moving to a finished piece, um, which which you know at which point. They can kind of say to the publisher, "Sorry, too late, <laughs> too late for any more changes." But they would, they would need to be very. In that case, they'll need to be very careful to, to, to kind of have everything nailed down and agreed before they produce a the final piece. Matthew, I am, um, I'm, I'm loving this conversation, but I'm very aware we're getting close to time. Um, so sure. what I'll do now is I'm just going to ask you. I have a set. Um, I'm just going to ask you two more questions that I, I feel. Okay. Uh, the listeners would really want me to ask on their behalf. Um, yeah. So this is just Little Island now because obviously you cannot speak for yeah. publishers in general. But how yeah. do you in Little Island choose which books to f- explore further or not? And by that I mean, you know, a lot of publishers, they um, I don't know what your um, submissions process is, but they'll ask for mm. the first 10 pages of the first two chapters or, or something along that. Yeah. Line. yeah. What are you looking for that makes you want to look at the full manuscript? What's what's the thing that will get a Little Island's attention? I think there's there's ultimately it comes down to two things: the quality of the writing, uh, at number one, and number two, uh, is there a market for it? Uh, it it's increasingly we increasingly find it difficult to to uh, bring a book to the market if uh, the main selling point is 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 that it's of exceptional quality. <laughs> That's yeah. it. That is quite disappointing discovery, but you know, uh, uh, you can't excite a newspaper editor by saying, we've got this book coming out and it's 
OK, because every publisher says that about every book. Uh, so so we do need things to be we, we really are, a, you know, a quality publisher and that's what we look for. But we also need to think about what's a way we can actually market this or what's a way we could we could uh, we can pitch this to to the, the, the media and so on. Um, and and when we're accept- one thing we ask when we're assessing a manuscript is. Um, is there a chance that an a, a, sorry is there a chance of a child or a teenager reading this book today in 20 or 30 years would like to buy it for their own child or or their own niece or or nephew um now that's a high bar most published most books do not continue selling 20 or 30 years after publication but the 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 idea is to think about is there a chance of this book becoming that kind of classic and it, could it have the sort of impact on a young reader uh, that would be so strong that would stay with them into adulthood and that they would want, want their child or a child in their life to, to have that experience for themselves? Yeah. Um, that's kind of a question we find really useful to think uh, to think about whether a book has the quality uh, that that we look for, and and also whether it has a chance at, at kind of having staying power, uh, rather than uh, meeting a particular market trend or yeah. or um, you know any kind of any kind of fad in the market. That's um that's that's a really good point. So w- what you're kind of saying then is um if if you're a publisher if you're a writer that is that wants their book to be published to to try and think along those lines try to write a story that will be timeless in some kind of way or will will yeah if you want to be published by little island think along those lines and you know uh, a lot of publishers are other publishers particularly publishers who work quickly and bring a book to press very quickly uh, maybe more geared towards thinking about you know what the market wants right now or or you know what's 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 gonna be wanted in six months time um whereas we're more interested in you know there's been a lot of submissions about covid recently um imagine that uh, yeah <laughs> and there are books now coming out from books about covid from from publishers whose model is trying you know is, is more about meeting immediate demand and um, Partly as a function of being small, uh, you know, we take time over books and there's kind of a long gestation period. And so we aren't really in a position to uh, just try to respond to what's what's happening in the world right now. We, we more think about does a book have staying power? Could it become a classic? Um, you know, can we hope to still be selling it in 5, 10, 15 years? That's um that's excellent information, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to be like pausing this podcast and going straight away to see if you're open for submissions yet, because they're like, oh, <laughs> there's this. Um, so my last question then for today, Matthew, is sure. what's the most common singular piece of advice you feel you give to aspiring authors and illustrators, or another way to look at it. Uh, a more negative way to look at it, I suppose. What's yeah. the one really common mistake that you're blue in the face telling people about? Um, the biggest mistake is definitely people not researching the publisher. Uh, mm-hmm. I think when people come to submit books, it's a bit overwhelming. You know, you Google children's publishers and you probably get hundreds of results. Uh, uh, but it is worth um, spending a bit of time researching publishers and what kind of books they do because you'll only waste your time um submitting to publishers that are not suitable for your books uh you know try to find a publish try to f- identify publishers that might be a good fit for your book and um, and i'll give you an, an example i i received a submission from somebody who said oh this uh, this is just like uh, another little island book you've done such and such. Now, such and such is in fact not remotely like the book that they were proposing, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, it it sort of put me off the submission because I thought they're trying to kind of uh, they've probably just had a quick look on our catalogue and picked out a book 
and and they're trying to to sort of hoodwink uh, yeah hoodwink us exactly yeah where I mean, they were pitching middle grade and the book was YA you know so that wasn't necessarily obvious from the from the listing on the website so so um, don't do that don't, you know, don't try to uh, you know just just I would say draw up a, a, a list uh, of publishers that might be a good fit for you and for your book um, and, 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 and follow their submission guidelines because publishers get so many books sent in that anything that comes in like to the wrong email account, it probably just going to get deleted without being opened. And we, we just have to be kind of ruthless about it because we get so many, we need to have a streamlined system for our own, you know, internal working uh, practices. So, you know, look at what the publisher's uh, asking you to do, and 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 submit. I, I and I totally appreciate what I'm describing is a bit of a time-consuming process for someone who's already spent a lot of time actually writing the thing. Um, but do it, it, I think it is worth it. There's, you know, there are quality submissions we receive, and there are ones which are a bit more uh, less thought has gone into them, uh, and and it makes a difference. And also. Think about what the the fact that the publisher um, the publisher needs to be able to sell the book, yeah. and particularly with bigger publishers, like uh, an editor might love a book, and then they have to go and pitch the book to their colleagues, including colleagues in sales and marketing, who will say, "Okay, I get that you love us. How are we going to sell it?" <laughs> so, the more you can help. An editor see the path to a book actually uh, selling and finding readers and and you know being being successful in the market. That's that's also a big help. Matthew, um, speaking of big help, this entire interview has been a big help to inspiring <laughs> authors. <I> Great. <laughs> um, Great. I hope so. Thank you so much for coming on to Wonderpod and answer my questions and. Uh, um, go back now to your submissions pile and find the next <laughs> thanks very much Connor it's been a great job for you thanks so much to Matthew for coming on to the show and telling us all about the inner workings of a publishing house for what it's worth right now as of uh, October 25th 2021 Little, Bo- Little Island are indeed open for submissions so go check it out I will say I took a look through myself uh, for my own kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> for my own publishing life because I'm not just a podcaster. I also want to be a children's author. I will say that their submissions page, which you'll find a link to it in the description, is really detailed. Um, they really took the time to let all of my fellow aspiring authors out there know what kind of books they are looking for. Like Matthew said in the interview, they are looking for books that will still, people will still look and want to buy it and read it in 30 years time which you know isn't a isn't a small thing to ask for but it is important and it's nice to see that Matthew what Matthew said in the interview back in August is still ringing true now in October but the one thing I think you should do is listen to Matthew when he said to pay attention to what Little Island is asking for before submitting and that's my biggest takeaway from this interview you really do um, have to pay attention to what a publisher wants to publish there's no point in sending a children's book to for example to a publisher who traditionally publishes adult horror and there's no point in sending an adult horror book to Matthew and Little Island so really pay attention to what you're doing tune in next week and I'll be talking to debut authors Katrina Sweeney and Rob Grant the two of them give a huge insight into the process of debuting a book from the author's side of things so we've had agent and now we've had publisher and now we're going to get to talk to the authors Um, They also talk about how the pandemic affected their books' releases and much more. Also, don't forget, if you haven't listened already, flick over and check the other episode that came out today where I interview literary agent Polly Nolan from Papercuts Limited. But until then, I'll see you all next week. Thanks for listening. I hope you found this as useful, as inspiring as I did. Don't forget that Wonderfest is happening from the 17th to the 21st of November 2021. Head over to wonderfest.ie to find out how else you can have a whale of a time. See you there!